hopefully. So I've, I'm live now. So hopefully if you search me and come to go to the top. Yeah. yeah, you should be able to ask to come on. Yeah. Perfect. Let's have a look. Perfect. We got it. Okay. Right. I'll I'll turn off um, Zoom because there's going to be a sound. So I'll just turn kind of Zoom off. Right, perfect. Turn every other technology off. And then we are good. Perfect. So we got there in the end. So we'll um, make a start finally. Cool. So I'm here with, yes, finally there, with Dr. Adam Bibby. So if you want to um, introduce yourself and then we'll kind of just go into like the questions and everything from there. Perfect. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Um, and hello to people that have followed us around the different platforms <laughs> of social media. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer down at Oxford Brooks. Um, my main research focus is looking at stress and well-being, um, which I think is very kind of pertinent in today's society. Um, in particular, looking at personality as well. So how people's different personalities interact with how they respond to stress. Okay. Yeah. So obviously at the moment, um like where we want to go down this more so is with if i was to say right now like things like border meeting comfort eating are big issues border meeting comfort eating are, are big issues at the moment it's probably one of the biggest barrier that people have and also when i speak to people one of the main things i hear is that everyone you know i know what to do but i still don't do it and obviously there's loads of factors in this but if we just go through first and foremost like a few like your main interests in terms of your main research areas and what you've kind of looked at personally that'd be great just to give a background of what where your kind of focus is yeah so if i was to give a one one word kind of answer to that it would be stress um okay. so i think everyone experiences different types of stress so it might be emotional stress, it might be physical stress of too much exercise. Um, it might just be um, kind of social stress as well. So particularly at the moment in terms of isolation, people may not be able to go out, socialise, that might be causing stress. Um, and as you, as you rightfully said, that stress manifests itself in different ways. Um, and some of those reactions to stress might be comfort eating. Okay, so sometimes now you hear about people obviously increasing the amount of food that they're eating at the moment, um, yeah. either through boredom, as you said, or maybe actually it's a coping mechanism for the stress that they're facing. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. So what what would you say, what like areas of the brain are involved and what can you actually do? What contributes to that behaviour? I know it's like a loaded question. But it'd be great to kind of look at the ins and outs of that. Yeah, so we've got the area of the brain at the front of the brain that's called the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Um, and this deals with kind of our emotions, our kind of processing of um, what we experience. So that's kind of the, the processing element of the brain. Then we have more the actual kind of um, stress reaction components of the brain as well. So that's areas like the amygdala. Um, so what my research during my PhD looked at was to see how different people respond differently to stress, okay? Um, because some people typically get quite stressed out by certain things and other people don't. Um, and I, for many, many years, people were suggesting that people who respond highly to stress in terms of increased blood pressure and heart rate often go on to develop cardiovascular disease and kind of high blood pressure and issues around kind of the heart. Um, and many people often thought that people that don't respond to stress are actually protected from those negative impacts. Um, so that really is where I focus my research, was looking at people who, who don't respond to stress, okay? Um, and I think in society, stress has become a very kind of negative 
um, connotation. When people talk about being stressed, they see it as a negative thing. Obviously, stress is there to, to activate us and allow us to actually get things done. Um, so really, when we are faced with certain situations that might stress us out, it is good to have that stress response. Obviously, we don't want it to be prolonged or to be too, too intense. But equally, the research that I did was looking at the elements at the other end, so people that don't get stressed. Yeah. Uh, and what we tended to find with those individuals was they were, they were more impulsive um, and they also had more addictive behaviour um, traits as well. So some of the research that I looked at was looking at, um, within our research group, was looking at um, exercise addiction. Okay, So people that kind of will miss social occasions because they want to go and do exercise or yeah. maybe 5K isn't enough now, so they have to do 10K and then maybe 15K, um, maybe exercising when they're injured as well. Um, and what we did was we actually found that individuals that don't respond to stress, so by stress we used a range of different kind of tasks, so some of them were mental arithmetic, some of them were public speaking tasks, um, and what we found was that actually people with these addictive personalities tended to also have these low stress responses, okay? Um, and then what we did as well was then look at the brain, um, kind of brain function and look at some brain imaging. And when we place these people that don't respond to stress into the scanner, we found that certain areas of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, didn't actually activate as much as other individuals who do experience stress. Right. Okay, so... Do you know, do, do you have any like hypothesis why? So an, an addictive personality means that you don't stress so much. Well, have tendency. Yeah. And we, we kind of termed it, we, we kind of termed it reward deficiency syndrome. Okay. So because people that might go out and do a 5k run, the general population would feel reward from that. These individuals who we've termed as having reward deficiency then don't actually get that same level of, level of reward from that, okay? So therefore, they have to go out and do more. So it kind of becomes a bit of a perfectionist kind of yeah. tendency and very addictive. So they have to keep doing more and more to get that level of reward that other individuals might feel by just doing that 5K run. Okay, so... Is it so if they don't they don't get the the symptoms of stress so much mm -hmm. right is that because they're more tolerant to it because that is stressful because that 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 reward deficiency syndrome sounds str and I can see elements of that in myself like for example I'm doing pull ups and dips at the, in my garden you know with two kids um, balancing work and stuff that's literally the easiest thing for me to do. But I, I have a target in my head every day and I'm almost like, right, I've got to improve that. Like, you know, yeah. so is it because that's stressful that builds a tolerance or what? Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think that the, there's a line whereby obviously as individuals, as humans, we want to do more, develop ourselves. Mm -hmm. So lots of your clients might come in and they, they do a certain amount of exercise. And of course, we don't want to rest on our laurels and say, okay, well, I'm just going to do the same, um, same circuit each day, every day. Of course, you want to do more and more. Yeah. But it's when it becomes um, unhealthy, that's probably where it, it kind of tips over, potentially into this reward deficiency syndrome. Um, and we looked at um, kind of impulsivity as well and risk-taking. And we also found that those individuals who had those low stress responses were also more impulsive and more likely to take larger risks. Um, and a, a, a kind of a key thing to consider within this as well is also that these individuals report that they still feel the same amount of stress. So subjectively, in terms of how much stress did you feel out of, let's say, 10 extreme stress, yeah. zero, nothing at all, 
they still reported the same level of stress as other individuals whose actual physiological, so the heart rate and the blood pressure responses were totally different. So what that is suggesting that actually it's areas of the brain that are different, yeah. that are actually causing different physiological responses to the stress compared to what people actually perceive. And, and is there a genetic thing with that in terms of that? Yeah. Potentially, yeah. And, and, we, we, and I think especially within kind of psychological research now, there's lots more research that is looking at those, those kind of mm. DNA genetic tests. You are, you've probably seen lots of it out there yeah. in terms of people getting their, their genes tested because then that mm. might show they're more um, open to certain mental health conditions, certain physical conditions, and also different responses to diet as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So with regards to the stress if they're so people who do respond with you know heart rate going up blood pressure like you said is that is that related to like cardiovascular like you said like vascular events like before is that an association there or is that something you're looking at no so so the the people that respond highly to stress yeah so, so let's say you're asked to give a public uh, a, a speech in front of people yeah. Okay, um, and often you'll have your cardiovascular responses, so increasing heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and obviously, we, we want a slight increase because that's natural. Um, but at, at the same time, we don't want it to be too prolonged and actually not related to the event. So we don't want it to be an extreme reaction for something that hopefully isn't too stressful to that individual. And for many, many years, people have proven that people who do have those exaggerated responses to stress do often go on to develop cardiovascular disease and heart-related problems later on in life. Okay. So, so essentially, it's kind of like a bell curve where you've got yep. people here that don't respond to the stress here. The majority will respond to yep. stress. And then people at the far end that have extreme responses to stress. Yeah. So, um, and I know this will, this will kind of come on to kind of what I said at the start about, um, kind of comfort eating, eating our response to it. Like, um, so I've had a question already. Michelle said, can the same be applied to other addictions, i.e. food? And I guess she's relating to the exercise addiction. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So we looked at, um, eating disorders as well. Yeah. And again, we did find that individuals with these we call it blunted responses to stress, um, were actually more likely to be, um, have disordered eating behaviours as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, with the, what kind of, uh, yeah, so Michelle said, yeah, with, with regards to food. So, how does this interact with, like, eating behaviour in terms of, like, coping mechanisms? Like, what what's kind of at, at play? Like, why is it that, so let's say someone, you know, maybe has some, uh, like, is there like a dopamine thing, a serotonin thing? You mentioned like reward deficiency syndrome. If we're addicted to the food side of it, are we doing it for like serotonin feel good? Or are we doing it because of kind of what you said with kind of wanting more? Like, did you see what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. What's like the interplay with that? It's, it's probably an interaction. It's a really good question, actually. So in terms of that reward deficiency, that, that kind of suggests that people aren't getting these hits of serotonin yeah. from normal activity. So maybe from, yes, yeah, so a reward eating there. It might yeah. be an action of you, you might eat. Let, let's take it back down. Let's say you have one burger and you feel quite good about it, okay? Yeah, and it was nice. It was high calorie. You got a bit of serotonin. It was it was nice to taste. It was enjoyable. But then potentially these individuals with this reward deficiency syndrome don't feel the same level of reward as somebody else from having that food. Okay. So they have to go and eat more of that food. Okay. 
So yep. it might be a chocolate bar rather than just maybe one chunk, two chunks of chocolate and getting that hit of serotonin. Individuals with this reward deficiency might have to go and keep eating and eating to get the same level of reward as someone who might just have two pieces of chocolate and get that same level. Okay. It's fascinating because like these are like chats I have a lot. So I'll chat to one person and they'll be like, yeah, I have my two squares of dark chocolate in the evening sorts me right out obviously yeah. there's so many in things at play right so they might be just in a good mood they might have had some good news so two chocolate does it whereas on another day if you're stressed tired it might not but also at the same time someone i had a chat earlier and someone was saying how they can have a curry or whatever a meal and they like the taste even though they're full up they just want more mm -hmm. of that and it's like I, I know I'm full up, but I'm wanting more. And do you feel like that could be related to that reward? Because they're, they're kind of loving the, the taste, the feeling of that reward. Yeah, and it's having that, having that kind of psychological awareness or self-regulation to say, okay, that's enough. Um, and that's maybe where kind of portion size comes into it. So there was a kind of a classic experiment that I think was done over in the, in the States, in America. Yeah. It was called the soup bowl experiment. And what happened was there was two bowls of soup. And for the one group of individuals, the soup just continued to fill up from the bottom. And people just continued to eat. Yeah. Whereas for other individuals where if they finished the bowl, they had to go and ask for another bowl, they actually consumed less soup compared to the other individuals where it just kept refilling from the bottom. And that's, that's kind of behavioral economics. And that's what happens a little bit now on Facebook and Instagram, where if you watch a video on Facebook now, it often just rolls over to the next video. So yeah. it's that kind of continual loop that you just, you're in it at the moment, you're in it and you have to break out of it as opposed to coming to a natural end at the bottom of that bowl of soup and then having to go out your way to actually go and get another bowl. So, yeah, often a lot of these kind of psychological techniques that are related to food have also been used now in social media to actually get people to watch more videos, to see more adverts, etc. So yeah. I think it is having that self-control to say, okay, yes, I've eaten a certain amount of chocolate now. I'm happy with that. As I said, certain individuals with that reward deficiency syndrome might have to keep going back and just eating more and more. Um, and we could talk about some of the coping mechanisms that we could look at as well, yeah. how we can maybe break, break from that. Yeah, that would be good to look at because it's difficult of, to, you know, just just stop right in the moment because a lot of people say you know um, i've got good intentions but mm -hmm. i start and i just kind of want more um and yeah like michelle said that that's so hard and it's like I, i've seen a few things like you know where you put if you put food six feet away you're less likely to get more but yeah at the same time it's yeah what kind of coping mechanisms what would you recommend for someone in this position who's like all good intentions starts off the day good maybe they have that reward deficiency and kind of two chocolate, two squares of chocolate, you know, you, you read online and it's like, have dark chocolate, it fights your cravings, you know, seven foods, like, but there's so much more into it. What would you kind of recommend with that? Um, so there's a couple of different coping strategies, well, not coping strategies, but coping um, kind of techniques, if you like. Yeah. So something called problem focused um, kind of coping. And then there's emotion-focused coping. So the problem-focused coping is about actually addressing the problem. Okay. So, for example, if you are stressed by a deadline at work, your problem coping would be to go sit down for an hour and actually finish that task up. Okay. Yeah. So that's seen as quite a, a kind of an adaptive, a good coping mechanism. Whereas for other individuals, they might go through emotional coping. So rather than actually addressing the problem, they just try and address the negative emotions that come with that problem. So let's say you are, um, the problem is that you've got that, that 
that deadline that's due quite soon and you're feeling quite anxious about that, the emotion coping might be that you start doing some meditation, some breathing to address the symptoms rather than the actual problem. Okay. And sometimes it depends which, which element you think is better, whether you can actually control the problem. So with that deadline, you can go and spend time on it. So that's a controllable, which is good. Okay. Um, or if you can't control the stressor, then probably the emotion focused coping is a better way to go about it. Okay. The emotion focused coping though, might then lead to the, the eating behaviors. Okay. If we're feeling quite stressed, the chocolate's in the cupboard, you want to go and find the chocolate. So it's, if, if it is an uncontrollable uh, 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 um, stress that's out of your control, then you want to do that emotion focused um, coping, then what you need to make sure that the coping techniques that you're doing are going to be effective. So is it exercise that makes you feel less anxious? Is it reading? Is it socializing with friends? So it's kind of finding the, finding the coping techniques that work best for you. Yeah. But for certain individuals, that will be totally different as well. Yeah. So I had a good question. What happens if you don't know what the problem actually is? Is that the problem in terms of the stress? So is this from Finch, I see there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So is that, so I guess if you're just feeling stressed, but you're not really sure why. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because some people uh, say that, I guess. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? A, a nice way to actually get, get to that. And you can do it through something called motivational interviewing. Yeah. Motivational interviewing is whereby rather than someone being the expert, such as a nutritionist mm. and the client, what you want to do is not for the nutritionist or the expert to tell the client, okay, you need to do this and that and the other, but actually for the client to actually come up with their own action plan. And a good way for people to understand how they might want to change their behavior or the stresses that they're facing is to actually reflect on a typical day. So for example, if you say, okay, well, I, I, I'm always stressed out you know, in the evening. You say, okay, well, can you just reflect on your normal day? So you wake up in the morning, what is your stress level? Okay. Why is that? So it's kind of self-monitoring and self-reflection yeah. in terms of what, what actually causes that stress at that moment in time. And then from that, hopefully, you can start to address it. Okay. So just to put a bit of context around that, let's say, for example, you're trying to increase somebody's physical activity mm. and they say, oh, but I've got no time in my day. I've got family. I work nine to five. I come back. I cook for the family. You say, okay, let's, let's actually review your typical day. So they get up, they work, they go to work. Yeah. <laughs> They have an hour's lunch break. So you say, okay, could you not possibly do 20 minutes of exercise during that hour? Okay. And then they might say they finish work at five o'clock, but the kids don't come home till seven. Mm. You say, okay, well, haven't you got a two hour gap there where you could actually incorporate some physical activity? So I think sometimes it's very easy. And this goes back to the stress element as well, is that we get into a routine of days kind of going by and passing and sometimes it's good just actually to take a step back and reflect on things and yeah. say okay, well what am i actually doing being a bit more purposeful being a bit more conscious of who you are and what you're doing each day and then yeah. hope that will allow you to be more aware of the things that are potentially causing that stress yeah it's almost like getting out of your own head isn't it because mm -hmm. Like if you put stuff down on paper, it's always, ah, you know what, it's not as bad as I, as I thought it would be. Like reflecting, things that worked well on the day. Oh, actually, I had a good day compared to, ah, oh, I'm just focusing on that one thing out of those 10 things that went, went bad. Um, do you 
think if you don't address this straight away, the coping strategy can become a habit rather than a de-stressor. In terms of addressing the stressor? So I guess, um, say, let's go back to that model. Uh, the one that, um, so you've got the problem focus and the emotion coping. So yeah. let's say you went down the emotion route and it was kind of, all oh, right, so I can give a personal example of this. Every time I've got something I need to do, but like even something that I've got to do, but it's not even that stressful, really. It's just, I know I've got to sit down and go to my office. This is why I love working in a coffee shop, which I can't at the moment. I'll go and grab a drink. Now, not that that's negative, but sometimes it's like a cup of tea or a coffee. And, you know, I put milk in it and stuff. But I have, quite, like, I wouldn't, if I was in a coffee shop, like we said about the barriers, if you like, to doing it, because it's just in my kitchen, I'll go and make one, then sit down. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, am I actually, I guess what, what Lucy Finch is saying on there is, um, is it actually now, me coping or is it now a habit which actually isn't actually helping me cope yeah and um, no yeah thank you um it's a bit of both really and sometimes that then errs into side of procrastination a little bit as well yeah uh, and we might do things that we think are helping but actually we're we're still not addressing the actual issue so so the way that i see it is that sometimes you treat the symptom and not the cause. So let's say, for example, if you've got pain down your leg that's being caused by sciatica, okay, and you went to see a physio, you know that the pain is coming from a bulging disc in your back and it's causing the pain down the leg. You don't want to necessarily treat the pain in the leg. You want to treat the cause, which is actually the disc in the back. So absolutely, I think sometimes it would be easy just to, to rub your leg or to do a coping strategy that you think is actually solving the symptom, but definitely you need to try and actually address the problem or the cause of the issue for in the long term to have a, have a positive impact. Yeah. So again, sometimes it's maybe just taking that step back and saying, actually, am I facing this problem or am I just kind of massaging the symptom that's, that's present? Yeah. Um, and I, I think as well, that goes back to how we perceive stressful situations. So we can either perceive it as a, as a challenge, okay, and activate and approach that situation, or we can see it as a threat and then we try and avoid that situation. Mm. And it's all about how we, how we actually change our perception of that, that specific stressor. And the reason that we get stressed, there's two different types of stress, as I mentioned before, there's positive and negative stress. So first of all, when you're faced with a potential stressful situation, you undergo something called primary appraisal, which is kind of like your first thought process of... Mm -hmm. Does this actually matter to me? Okay. So, for example, if you've got um, if you've got that deadline that's coming up, does that actual does it does it actually matter if you get it in on time or not? Is it just a soft deadline? If it's a soft deadline and it doesn't matter, then you're not going to get stressed by it because it, you don't really care about about the outcome of that. But if it does matter you will then go through something called secondary appraisal, which is kind of like your second, second thought process. And this is where you weigh up your resources, so kind of what time have you got to spend on that deadline and the actual demands of the situation. So let's say your deadline is 5 p.m. today mm. and you've got three hours, three and a half hours, you look at the resources that you've got and say, actually, would I be able to complete that work within that three and a half hours? If you can, then that will make you sit down and spend those three and a half hours working on it proactively to get it done by the deadline. Yeah. So that's 
positive stress, that's activating. That's when we see it as a challenge. So we're like, okay, three and a half hours, let's crack on. The negative stress is when we actually don't perceive our resources to meet the demands of the situation. So let's say, for example, we know that it's going to take around three hours to complete this piece of work, mm. but we know that we've got to go and pick the kids up, we've got another meeting. So actually, we've only got an hour and a half worth of time to actually dedicate towards that task. That's when it becomes negative stress because your perceived resources that you have, i.e. the time that you've got to spend on it, isn't actually going to meet the demand of the situation. So it's about how we change our perception of our resources and the demand of the situation to hopefully allow that stress to be a positive experience as opposed to a negative one. Okay. Yeah, so if we were to go back a little bit, just before I forget this question, um, how common is reward deficiency syndrome? Because obviously, like, when you say that, a lot of people might just see themselves in that and go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I've got. Um, yeah, how common is it? And, and yeah, how's it diagnosed as well? So it's not officially tested. So we don't actually know. That, that's okay. a problem. Um, and I... During my PhD, I was kind of thinking, you know, what are the long lasting effects of, of the research that I was doing? And I was thinking, well, is it possible within school children to actually give them a, a stress task mm. and actually look at their stress responses? Because then if people are having those high stress responses, which then might go on to lead to cardiovascular disease and heart heart related um, kind of issues, could we then give them the coping mechanisms to allow them to reduce their stress? And then equally, the individuals who demonstrate those low stress responses, could we then make sure that we support them so they don't engage in risky behaviours and addiction? Um, unfortunately, that that's not really possible, but that would be the ideal thing. So. In terms of the question, how, how prevalent is it? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. No, that would be, that is fascinating. So, yeah, so uh, do you think that the people, so would you, would you say that the, the deficiency, reward deficiency syndrome, if people have low stress, so that they have a, a low stressful response that they can still be then addicted to food though or is that more of an emotional com emotional comfort no def i think i think they could still be addicted to food definitely okay oh well, yeah i just well, lost um, it um oh, okay yeah it doesn't have to come from um actually kind of trying to cope with the stress it could just be areas of their brain that that needs more and more food or whether it be more exercise or whether it be more um internet addiction as well as also been shown to be related to this and alcohol addiction um and the use of drugs so it seems to be these areas of the brain the rewards kind of activation areas that people just have to activate more to, to feel that same level of reward essentially okay so what what other like behavior change models techniques are recommended especially for for people with that kind of addictive if they're looking for that reward more and more and more what can people do instead i know we've we've touched on a few things already and that they're going to kind of range but is there kind of something some model or anything that people can look at to use and apply yeah, um, so it's different behaviour change models and lots of them out there, the trans-theoretical stages of change model, um, a theory of planned behaviour as well. Um, so from, from the theory of planned behaviour, there's kind of three different elements that mm. suggest a kind of the three factors that lead into our intention and then intention leads into the behaviour. The first one is the attitude. 
So what is our attitude towards exercise or towards healthy eating? Okay. So we might have a positive or negative attitude. So we might think that actually exercise isn't that good for us. Therefore, we get hot and sweaty, don't particularly enjoy it, don't want to do it. So we want to try and change the attitude towards that to be a positive attitude. The other element is also our social norm. Okay, so what is our perception of how much exercise other people do? Okay, mm. and what type of exercise and what intensity and for how long do they exercise? And then the other element is how much control we perceive over that situation. Okay, so do you think that you actually have the ability to go out and do 10 minutes of exercise walking around the park. And what we want to do really is create a positive attitude, get that social norm, people's perception of the social norm, which is kind of what are other people doing to be realistic and also allow them to feel in control as well. So rather than asking someone to go out and do a 10K run where they might not feel much control over their ability to do that, why not start low and get them to do little bits of kind of small doses of low intensity exercise so they feel as though they have the control to do that, okay? If we can kind of um, address those three elements, those three sources, that will lead into the intention to go out and to do that exercise. And then we need to change that intention into the behavior. The big thing is there's always a gap between intention and behavior. Yeah. Okay? We always have the best intentions in the world sometimes to do something. Yeah. And it doesn't actually always yeah. come out into the behavior itself. Okay. And that's where we can bring in these behavior change techniques, which allow us to change that intention into that behavior. Okay. So some of those might be um, goal setting. Okay. So, if you intend to go out and, I don't know, accumulate 10 miles of walking over the week, then rather than just saying, okay, I intend to do that Monday morning, by next Sunday evening I'll do that, why not break it down into smaller goals? So maybe you do two, two miles a day on, on five of those days to achieve that, then yeah. you, you're addressing those goals. And what happens is when we reach a goal, we feel increased levels of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is kind of situation-specific self-confidence. So when we feel confident in our ability to do something, we're more likely to do it. Okay? The best way to achieve that confidence is to actually be able to do it successfully. Yeah. So rather than saying, okay, I'm going to go out and do a 10-mile walk, and not achieve it, that's going to knock our confidence. If you go out and achieve a one mile walk, you're like, okay, I've achieved something there. And then you feel confident, okay, why can't I do one and a half miles tomorrow? And then over time, you just build up that confidence and that intention then becomes stronger, which then transfers into actual behavior. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because in our initial sessions so we would have almost like a, a goal setting session without calling it that but because the initial stigma around goal setting is oh i'm not setting another goal you know i've yeah. set enough of them in my life and you know and i get it because it's almost like before they might have set a goal and it's like one a goal where they're not in control of so for example i would say like a weight loss goal is fine but a weight loss goal in itself is out of your control you mm -hmm. can't you can't have 100 percent control over losing a stone in a month or whatever a year whatever but what you can control is what the things you do so like we have three elements food you know one habit you'll do with your food today one habit you'll do with your fitness to so how far you go what you do and then one around kind of mindset be it meditation self-care doing something fun for you a nap something like that so something it's 100 percent in your control whether you tick it off or whether you don't so yeah that that's good to put it into like the self-efficacy part of it and how you are building on that belief and confidence. Cause actually belief and confidence probably come back into, I guess, a coping mechanism for stress on the way in, in some aspect to say, you know, what, I've got, I've done this before. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I think the the different goals that you mentioned there is is important, as you said, because mm. you want to have that long term goal, the outcome goal, but then you also want the little processes as well. So as you said, the the weight loss might be the outcome goal that just happens by the small processes that you do every day. So yeah, definitely yeah. something to say. Yeah, and then it's interesting what you said about um, social norm because. Yeah, like, obviously, we have a, a group, like, everyone is in, like, kind of similar journey. You know, we have a, a it's a ladies only program. And actually, the community part of that is huge. Like, some, some of the ladies have even said before, obviously, when, when we do in person sessions, you know, it's nice just to turn up and hear someone go, Oh, I really couldn't be bothered to come in today, but I'm here. And it was like, Oh, you don't have to feel super motivated all the time. You can just, you know, feel a bit demotivated and actually actually just come along and, and do it and then actually feel better for it but be okay with not being super motivated and smiley you'd, like you would see on a poster in a gym like you know the okay. old cross trainer smile it almost puts you off doesn't it because it's like oh I'm never smiling on a cross trainer <laughs> yeah and and especially in terms of you know women's fitness and men's fitness magazines one obviously there's lots of airbrushing that goes on um, to put on the cover but also at that time that those photos are taken those individuals are often they've increased their weight and then they've decreased it so yeah. it's not a sustainable thing um, and it as you say can put a lot of people off so it's looking at the social norm of well what about the the mother that's had two children what about the dad that works you know 12 hours four shifts for the NHS four on four off and it's yeah being realistic with that social norm and not not looking at the goal as being too big and unachievable because then you will feel no confidence in your ability to actually achieve that you yeah. need to actually look at something that is realistic and it is challenging and again it comes back to that stress response of what is the demand and what are your resources if the demand is realistic, but it's challenging, then you will feel the confidence to actually go out and approach it. If it is too unrealistic, that's when you'll avoid it. Because as humans, we don't like failure. So we will actually just withdraw from the situation. We won't turn up to the class. We won't try and do any exercise because you think I'll never be able to actually achieve that goal. Yeah, no, that makes some sense. And from another I guess that's a bit, if we go towards like the eating side of it, uh, I guess you've got, so, you know, they do like, I've seen a few studies back um, where people's decisions are influenced by what other people eat. So I guess you've got that aspect as well. Like, you know, if people around you always have those foods and you're like, you know, say you go to work and you bring in a salad, but you usually get, I don't know, you go out every lunch and you get burger and chips or whatever and you bring the salad that's i guess it's the difficult environment isn't it which makes it not normal and not something you maybe even want to do or or you maybe you want to do it but you don't want to do it because it's not the norm i guess that's yeah. a big thing as well isn't it like especially if you've got family back at the moment in like a lockdown kind of position and you know everyone's bringing in different foods and stuff and you're like oh i wasn't not used to being around this this amount of food and it's like oh you're not are you being boring if you're not having a drink da, 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 da. like you know stuff like that, that that comes into it um yeah does that make sense any any kind of uh evidence around that scenario or suggestions around that scenario yeah no we are definitely influenced massively by what other people do around us so there's it's not necessarily related to food but i think it the, the concept of it relates quite quite nicely back um so that was in terms of there was a, a study done in a doctor's surgery in the waiting room and what this study wanted to do is to see how influenced people are by others around them so what the researchers did was they actually stood up in the waiting room and for no particular reason yeah, and the other the other patients that were in the room were then looking around, thinking, <laughs> "Why are these people stood up?" <laughs> and then they actually started to join in. 
oh, you know, right. stood up and they didn't know why they were stood in standing <laughs> up. But we are just influenced yeah. by things around us. Um, also, implicitly, so things that we aren't consciously aware of, also are used sometimes in kind of commercial settings, and that's called nudging. Um, so these things are kind of things that people might do to get us to change our behavior, okay? Um, so we might see it if you go to the supermarket, what is often at the supermarket checkout, single chocolate bars and yeah. things like that. So they're the nudges that you go, oh, okay, I've done the shopping now. That'll be a nice little treat for when I get back mm -hmm. home. So we can use those nudges for ourselves in terms of rather than having, I don't know, fizzy pop on the, on the table at dinner, why not have a jug of water instead? Yeah. yeah? Um, there's also nudging that happens in underground stations as well. So they did this over in Barcelona and in Singapore in the, the public transport um, stations. It's called a point of choice prompt. So when you're faced either with the escalators or the stairs, which one do, which one do you take? Um, and these point of choice prompts have had little messages on them saying things like 10 minutes of stair climbing a day, protect your heart. Yeah. And that's changing that behavior attitude that I mentioned before. So then people's attitude of, oh, the stairs, you know, I'm going to get a little yeah. bit sweaty. They now say, oh, look at the benefit of that. Mm. And that changes their attitude towards it. So we can do that in terms of putting trainers by the door. Yeah. No. Or, or writing a meal plan on, a, yeah. on our fridge. And you might have your, I don't know, three, four meals that you might have throughout the day. And then two treats at the bottom that you can have a treat, you know, a couple of treats a day. That's absolutely fine. Mm. And then by utilizing that, it means that we kind of stick into a set routine. So that's a nudge. So when you might go to the fridge to get some ice cream out, you've got your meal planner there. You know, like, okay, well, I don't need the ice cream. I already have yeah. my two treats. And then you can see the treats that you're going to have tomorrow. So it's kind of like, well, I've, I've got a chocolate bar for tomorrow, so I can I can save the ice cream now and actually eat it tomorrow. Yeah, there's lots of points in that. Like, it's like, so Michelle just said, uh, you know, it's like if someone else wants it, if someone else has got food, I want it, even if I'm not hungry. Yeah. It's almost like uh, that's a nudge in that direction, isn't it? And it's mm -hmm. like, I guess, you know, something we do a lot with the benefits card or something we're actually designing now. But yeah, writing down the goals the sorry the benefits of what you're doing to remind yourself of that every day and, and keeping it top of mind awareness whether that's on the fridge or on the side i know one of the ladies she has a stick man and so she's drawn a stick man put it in her cupboard so that when she opens it it's just a big stick man and with a little speech bubble that says what are you doing in here <laughs> <laughs> and she said it just kind of it just kind of jogs her a little bit enough to go ah yeah for example i'll, I'll be like Brutally honest with this, kids are a great way to get around this. So the other day I got the, we have a kilogram of yogurt and I got it out and I was making banana pancakes in the morning and um, I got the thing out and I just put my spoon in and I was starving. I just finished an early morning workout and I had a few spoonfuls and I noticed my daughter walking in and I was like, as soon as she walked in, I went, put it away. <laughs> like, and I was thinking, wow, like that behavior, I was obviously embarrassed of that behavior, you know, yeah. it's quite interesting. Like, but it, it, that was like a nudge to say to me, yeah, that, that probably needs to stop a bit. Or I need to <laughs> just make sure I'm dishing. So another thing we say is like, you know, sit down when you eat, serve in, in crockery, you're going to be more mindful of what you have. But yeah, yeah like m reminding yourself constantly of the benefits, like some of those have like a, an item of clothing they want to fit into just out on the side. But yeah, trainers yeah. by the door. Um, I've heard going to bed, in your gym gear so that you have to get up mm -hmm. and if you don't work out first thing in the morning the cool thing about that is that you're um you have to actually get out dressed out of your workout gear without having exercised and that's a bit like oh you know i didn't do it you know so it's yeah. kind of just, just shortening the the habits of it yeah yeah and i think that goes back when we we're talking about the soup bowl experiment 
is it's just breaking that cycle. Yeah. If it's if you've got a spoon and a tub of ice cream, yeah. you might just keep going. So as you say, if you take the portion out, put it into the bowl, mm. once you finish the bowl, the bowl's finished. You yeah. then have to go back to the actual tub of ice cream to refill the bowl. If you eat from the bowl, then you just continue to eat and eat. I know yeah. I'm guilty of that. Yeah, I, I could go for a <laughs> kil- I could go for a kilogram of so we eat loads of yogurt. Like I could literally just be sat stood there or whatever, spoon in, and I, if I was just thinking about something before I know it, I could go through it. Mm. Yeah. And it's it's so true. Like your environment. Like we had a fruit and veg box. All the fruit and veg was over by one side, and we were thinking, oh, no one's eating any fruit. I moved it down so that the kids can just grab it. Granted, mm. I had like a few pears with one bite out of, but they, the amount of fruit they eat then is like ridiculous. Like they just grab it like throughout the day when they're hungry, go in and out. And I think, you know, that's, that comes into another point around the food side of it. Like we're so, we're sometimes quite stuck in our ways of like eating at certain times, snacking, it's 12 o'clock, I must eat. And mm. something I've observed with um, my kids is that they'll sit, be sat there eating lunch and then they'll, they might just um, come down and, and I'll be like, are you finished? And they go, yeah. And I, um, I say, do you want me to leave it there? And since I've, since I've asked that, it, one means I won't finish their dinner because she'll reply and say, yeah, yeah, leave it. So if I have it, then it's like, I told you to leave it. And it's like, okay. But then she'll come back in and just grab a bit later if she's hungry. And I think we're almost like sometimes conditioned to just one finish our meal. Like once you left the table, like that's it rather than actually i think kids must be more most in tune with their hunger ever right yet we're like it's lunchtime you gotta be hungry or you know we have emotional in terms of like i've cooked that meal for you you know you know because i get it sometimes i cook a curry and they're like they're not even just not hungry and they don't really eat it but they might eat it later but I, in, in this in my head i'm thinking oh i spent time cooking that curry you know there's like so many things we like beliefs inside and but i'm aware of those thoughts that come out and i'm like yeah that's that's a weird that's an interesting thought that comes up yeah yeah and there's there's also a thing called implementation intentions as well yeah if this is another thing to get that intention through to the behavior so for example if you say okay i'm going to go for a, a one mile run wednesday evening you you already plan out what's going to happen if it's raining or if you have to work late. Okay. So rather than it just throwing you out of your original plan, you say, oh, yeah, but it's raining. I'm not going to go for the run. You already have another alternative plan that you will do. Yeah. So you'll get to the gym and do, I don't know, 30 minutes on the cross trainer rather than just saying it's raining. I'm not going for that run. And yeah. we can do the exact same thing with with food as well. Mm-hmm. So what happens if you walk to the to the fridge to get that ice cream, like you said, why don't you have the bowl of fruit on top of the fridge? Mm-hmm. Then you go, okay, I can have the fruit instead of the ice cream. And then you'll feel better about yourself, hopefully. Um, but definitely what we don't want to do is restrict ourselves to a place that we, we aren't then actually kind of enjoying Mm. enjoying food we, we've seen it a lot recently with the lockdown it's amazing when you can't when you're told not to do something people will want to do it so i couldn't believe the amount of cars up at the local national trust park mm. which on a normal day would let's say there'd be 10 cars there as soon as people were told that they couldn't do it there was 20 cars yeah. there yeah. It's that resentment theory of when yeah. you're told you can't do something, you want to do it more. Yeah. So absolutely what we don't want to do is say you're never going to have ice cream or you, know, mm. you, can't, you can't do the good things that you actually enjoy, but it's just maybe rewarding yourself with that rather than actually that being the default go-to when you're stressed. Yeah, because again, that's another point, isn't it? If you only have it when you're stressed, it's always going to make you feel better because you're stressed, right? Whereas maybe if you try and have it in the morning when mm. you're not stressed, it might just start to create a different relationship with it. Yeah. You know, so of course anything's going to make you feel better when you're stressed. But if you, because mm. then we start to associate, I guess, a Snickers bar or whatever with feeling better, 
right? But with the information intention thing you made, that's a really good point. Like, we have like five minute and 10 minute workouts um, that people can do. So if they are short on time, they can get that, that done in that. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. So, yeah, I think we've covered quite a lot in there, actually. Um, yeah, anything else you kind of want to add to that at the moment? Oh, yeah, with the uh, fruit thing as well. Uh, one of those also puts, and you mentioned the fruit on the top again. She's actually had quite a lot of success by just putting an apple in front of, like, where the chocolate biscuits, biscuits crisps are and stuff, mm -hmm. just, just as a, a reminder. Um, and I know the other evening, um, my wife, not blaming, but, you know, she brought in some chocolate. It was dark chocolate, all good, but almost sometimes that makes it worse because I know it's healthy, so I might ask permission. But yeah. anyway, it's there, and I'm watching the film, and I'm thinking, I'm not even hungry. And then all I did was slid it. I just chucked it to the other side of the living room, and then it was like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Um, cool. So, yeah, where can people learn a bit more about your research or what you do or is anywhere you or any resources that you recommend and, and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, can, can I post something on your Facebook page? Yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Post it on there and then um, we'll go from there. Obviously, um, some of those who are in here now will be in the Q&A on Thursday too um, yeah. in our group. So that will be on, on Zoom. So what will be cool is that they, they've probably got a lot from this, but then they can go away and actually get into more like nitty gritty questions and we just kind of work through them together um on first yeah. as well yeah absolutely and probably a good the, the thing for for the people watching to get the most out of it will be to bring some personal questions as well yeah. um don't be afraid to ask those and i if i can't answer them i'll be truthful and say not sure but yeah i can definitely say have you thought about this or have you thought about you know approaching it in this way um I don't know if people practice mindfulness as well. Um, that's another big thing that's come out in the kind of the addictive behavior kind of realm um, in terms of making people more consciously aware of what they're doing in that moment. Um, and you can do it sat in front of the telly and um, you can do it at any moment. If you, you feel that urge to want to go and get a snack, doing a little bit of mindfulness is, is really beneficial. So maybe again, if people want to ask questions around kind of breathing techniques, yeah. mindfulness, etc., feel free to, to bring them to the Q and A. Happy yeah. to help. Perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. No, that's great. Thanks Thank you very much. That's and thank all the viewers and your, your nice comments as well. Yeah. And we got there in the end. We did. Lovely. So Facebook, Instagram, Instagram <laughs> one. So I will post this replay up on the podcast and also on my Facebook page. Um, okay. Yeah, brilliant. And if you could post that, that'd be great. Lovely. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Bye Take guys. care. Bye, Bye. See you later.